anti-caste fighters and social reformers in India in the late 19th century. Another remarkable figure was Jyotiba Phule, who was learned, learned to, uh, called later as Mahatma Phule. And if you see his life and teachings, Jyotiba Phule did not advocate the advancement of any particular caste interests, any particular oppressed caste. He talked about bringing all to a certain level of equality and emancipation. And he talked not only of emancipation of the oppressed caste, he was one of the pioneers in talking about ending gender oppression and stressing gender equality. So the whole social reform and social renaissance movement which began in the latter half of the 19th century in India, of which uh, Sri Narayana Guru was an outstanding exponent, had a common universal message of emancipation for all, of freeing people from caste and religious oppression and orthodoxy and contributing to the development of a modern secular consciousness. Modern secular democratic consciousness in Kerala was due to the combination of four currents. Firstly, the national movement against British imperialism. Secondly, the anti-caste social reform movements. Thirdly, the anti-feudal peasant movements and struggles. And fourthly, the development of a modern working class movement. It is these four currents which contributed to development of a modern secular consciousness in Kerala. Saw the awakening of the lower caste and this awakening had a radical democratic content. Narayana Guru's call for social equality emanated from a travancore where people were divided sharply in caste hierarchies. And unlike in other parts of India, it was not just untouchability, but also unapproachability and unseeability. It was such an oppressive caste hierarchical order against which the Guru raised his voice and demanded an end to such caste iniquities and slavery. And it was also in that travel core where three major religions held sway, Hinduism, Islam and Christianity. And why I underline the fact that the Guru's message was universal and not sectarian was when he founded the temple at Arvipuram. He inscribed on the wall a message which said, devoid of the dividing walls of caste or hatred for other faiths, rival faiths. This was the inscription that he put on the walls of the temple. And this is the spirit and the essence of the social reform movements which developed in the late 19th century. The specific character of this uh, awakening of social reform and anti-caste movement in Kerala was that it was also linked up and part and parcel of the national movement against British rule and also uh, the princely state rules. Unlike in many other parts of India where the social reform movement and the anti-imperialist movement got delinked. But in Kerala, if you see the history of the 1920s and 1930s for instance, the temple entry movements took place in Vaikam and later in Guruvayur. The Congress party 
actively participated in these movements, but it did not get confined to only the national movement. The social reform movement and anti-caste movement, the forces which were taking up the challenge and the issues of the social reform movement were also part of this struggle. They both combined. Though there were limitations in this struggle, in the Vaikam and Guruvayur Satyagraha, if you read the histories of that today, the Gandhian approach imposed certain limitations, which even Sri Narayana Guru was not very happy about the way it was conducted. Uh, he was more radical about how to fight untouchability. But the confluence of these two movements is very important. Kerala made more advances in creating a new secular democratic consciousness because both these currents converged in Kerala. And one of the major reasons for that convergence in Kerala was the emergence of the, the left current, the Congress Socialist Party and later the Communist Party, which ensured that both these currents go together and they are not separated. E.M.S. Nambudripat pointed out in his uh, various writings on the history of the evolution of Kerala society, at the crucial time, the entry of the socialists, the left congress and then the communist party took this radical democratic vision forward. There was a democratic content of the various caste organizations which had emerged at that time, which was whether it was the SNDP, whether it was the NSS, whether it was the Unni Namudri movement. In all this, there was a democratic content where they were trying to reform and end various types of social oppression uh, through the movements or organizations that they built up. But it had its limitations. What the left in Kerala and the Socialist Party first and then the Communists did was to understand that the fight against this old social order, which included the class exploitation of the Jimmy landlord system, the feudal exploitation, the social oppression through the hierarchical caste order, and the socio-cultural aspects coming out of this sort of feudal society. All three things have to be fought. The economic dimension, the political dimension, and the social and cultural dimensions. And that was taken up. And the fight against the Jimmy type of landlordism and the development of powerful peasant movements of the tenants, of the actual cultivators, etc on the one hand, and the development of the working class movement. In the same Travancore, in centers like Alapura, the powerful working class movement developed of the coil workers and so on. In Malabar also, in Korikod and other centers, Kannur, the new working class which had emerged had been organized. And along with that, the fight against caste oppression was taken. And the Communist Party and the left actually then took it to a higher level by saying that all the poor, all the working sections, all the exploited sections of all castes and communities have to be united. There has to be a class unity built on that basis, which took this social democratic uh, social reform movement and the anti-caste movement and the anti-feudal movement and the anti-imperialist movement to a higher level. Independence. Two processes took place. One is public action and the other is successive left-led governments which came <coughs> into being in Kerala after the Kerala state was formed from 1957 onwards. Public action, by public action I mean collective people's action or movements. 
it was this collective people's movements and in the sphere of policy making the contribution made by successive left led governments which uh, laid the foundations for much of the social gains that was made in kerala in the post independence period the implementation of land reforms the high literacy rates that were achieved through the expansion of education the public distribution system uh, which came into being uh, from the late 60s which is still today better in kerala than in the rest of india the decentralization of powers to the local bodies in the panchayats etc and ensuring the rights of the work, different sections of the working people this is what enabled kerala to achieve social gains much more compared to the rest of the country or other parts of the country so what was achieved to some extent in the pre independence period that was built upon in uh, the post independence period in kerala swandhatri shesham keralathil adhigam edavittu edavittu adhigarathil vanna edudu paksha maranam we cannot say the same situation prevails today in kerala the social reforms and the gains achieved in the state are being steadily eroded and is under threat from the impact of neoliberalism and the rise of the communal forces in india as a whole finance capital driven globalization tends to exacerbate narrow identities of caste religion and ethnicity this is happening all around the world and the neoliberal regime nurtures egoism individualism and consumerism in its drive to bring everything under the sway of the market both these factors have had a deep impact in india and in kerala too the rise of the hindutva forces as a form of majoritarian communalism coincides in india with the ushering in of the new liberal policies in the beginning in the start of the 1990s when i speak about hindutva it should not be confused with hinduism hindutva is a political ideology i don't want to go into the history of that uh vidhi savarkar is the one who coined the term hindutva and he was a person who would never go to a temple he had not much religious faith but he was interested in using the hindu religious identity as a vehicle for political mobilization to establish a state where there is the supremacy or the hegemony of what he called the hindus now you can be a devout hindu you can have deep faith in the hindu religion and the hindu religion is such where you can have a variety of faiths within the hindu religion varieties of different ways of uh, practicing your faith and also be secular in your outlook that is we have in india all through the in the post independence period since the constitution of india proclaimed india to be a secular republic we have people in public office holding public office who are devout <coughs> believers in various religions whether it's hindu religion or islam or christianity or jain or buddhist or sikh but in their exercise of responsibility in the public office their religious beliefs and faiths do not influence their decisions there is one aspect of secularism the secularism demands the separation of state and religion of state 
and religion and politics. Now, the Hindutva ideology does not believe in this. It is anti-secular because it says that for a citizen of India, the citizenship is decided by your Hindu identity. Of course, uh, they claim that everybody is a Hindu in India. As long as they do not practice the religion which has come from outside India. All, all, all are Hindus, except they should not be adherents of a foreign religion, which is not indigenous to India. So when you reduce citizenship to religious identity, then you will face serious trouble. And it means you are undermining the concept of secularism and the concept of citizenship as it is defined in the Indian constitution. Further, Hindutva seeks to project nationalism in India as Hindu nationalism. There is only one genuine nationalism which is Hindu nationalism. You must recall the prophetic words of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, when he said that uh, it is easy for majority communalism to masquerade as nationalism and it is easy to characterize and label the minority communities' feelings of any type of nationalist identity as separatism. And it is easy for the majority communities' nationalism to masquerade as nationalism. And today we are being told that nationalism means being a Hindu nationalist. This is something which is fundamentally inimical to what the constitution of India uh, proclaims. And that constitution, one of the key contributors or drafters of this constitution was Dr. Ambedkar, who as you know came from one of the most oppressed castes or communities in India. But when he talked about emancipation, he did not see it in narrow terms of the emancipation of the untouchables or the emancipation of in those days what was considered to be uh, untouchables or scheduled caste. He wanted a political system and a constitutional order in India where everybody is treated as a citizen and citizens have equal rights irrespective of caste, community and creed. So this is the fundamental basis of the constitution which Hindutva seeks to challenge. I would also like to point out that there is a class aspect to communalism. Communalism of any variety. Communalism is a weapon to consolidate the class rule of the big capitalists and the richer sections. Because communalism is an instrument to disrupt the unity of the people, the unity of the working people. And that facilitates, <laughs> it makes it easier for the ruling classes to push through their present neoliberal policies. And we, what we have in India today is an alliance of the big business, the big capitalists, the corporates and the Hindutva communal forces. They serve each other's ends. So it is very necessary to fight communalism, not only to maintain communal harmony, which is very important of course. It is also necessary to fight communalism because it disrupts the unity of the people, the working people. It prevents the possibilities of their coming together for collective action to demand from the state and the government better living conditions, better working conditions, better uh, uh, jobs, etc. So this is very important today in India that this effort to divide people, pit people against each other is combated and without fighting the communal forces you cannot be able to carry forward the struggle of the Indian people, the various sections of the people for a better life, for an end to the 
poverty, for the end to the exploitation, and for an end to the social oppression that they face in their daily lives. In India, have enormous problems because what is what we have experienced as economic growth or economic development is something which is highly skewed and distorted. And therefore you have some of the world's richest people today in India. And you also have the, some of the world's largest number of poor people also. And unemployment is growing daily. Just before leaving India, all the newspapers carried a report about Uttar Pradesh, as you know, it is the biggest state in India. They were the government of Uttar Pradesh advertised post jobs for 368 peons. That is a class four, grade four category of peons. They advertised for 368 posts. And they said it has to be online applications. They got 23 lakh applications from Uttar Pradesh, from people. And out of that more than 23 lakhs, there were 1.5 lakh graduates for the job of Pure. There were 25,000 postgraduates for the job of a Pure. And there were 250 PhDs, doctorate, who got doctorates for this job. And now the government says it will take us nine months to process these applications and then conduct interviews. So this is the extent of joblessness in India today. So what communalism does is instead of addressing this, it will seek to pit one section of people against the other. And it will be a combination of communalism also is nurtured by uh, caste divisions also. So they will say it's because some other community is getting a better deal than us. That is why we are not getting jobs. Or somebody else is being pampered. Somebody is being privileged. And therefore, pitting one section of the people against the other will ensure that you can be sure that there will be no jobs produced in the country because they will be busy fighting each other. So this is the nature of communalism which seeks to distract and divert people from the real issues that they face. Sahambatika Puryagati, specter of uh, authoritarian imposition of Hindutva values, so-called Hindutva values, is looming very seriously as a danger in India today. The social and cultural fabric of our society is being threatened by this authoritarian imposition. I do not want to go into it in much detail because I think all of you follow very closely what is happening in, the, in India through the media, through the television, newspapers, etc. There are now places in India where there are prohibitions on various types of food that you can have. I live in Delhi and this is the first time I have seen. I have lived 45 years in Delhi. And uh, we have in the Indian Institute of Technology a campus in Delhi. You know the IITs are some of the premier institutions in our country. And for the past one year, no non-vegetarian food is served in the hostels of the IIT. And you know students come from all over the country to the IIT, it's not from one particular place. But this has already been imposed, it's a ban. Of course if you ask them, they say no, no, we had some problems supplying meat here, etc, etc. But effect is for one year, only non-vegetarian fare will be supplied to the students in the hostels. So, you are finding this creeping authoritarianism in how you, what you can eat, what you can read, what films you can see, 
what textbooks can be prescribed in the educational system and intellectuals, artists, writers and social activists, social reformers who do not agree with this authoritarian Hindutva values, they are targeted and intimidated and killed also. In the last two years, we have lost three persons in India. The first was Narendra Dabolkar. The second, Govind Pansari, both in Maharashtra. And the third is recently Professor Kulbargi in Karnataka. What is common between them? Narendra Dabolkar was doing what Sinarayana Guru and Jyotiba Phule and many others started doing in the 19th century, fighting superstition, obscurantist practices, fighting against fake godmen who cheat people. So he was conducting a movement against superstition and demanding that the Maharashtra government and assembly pass an anti-superstition law so that people are not cheated by these so-called uh, religious frauds and who make people do black magic and various other things. He was killed, shot dead in Pune, more than two years ago. Govind Pansari was also very active. He was a communist. He was the secretary of the Communist Party of India in Maharashtra at one time. But he was socially very active. He should actively intervene in all social issues and questions. And therefore he incurred the wrath, wrath of some of the extremists. And he was also shot dead in February this year. And now Professor Kulbargi, who was the Vice Chancellor of the Kannada University in Ampi, he was shot dead. <laughs> he was a follower of Baswana. Some of you may know he was a very important Lingayat figure, religious social reformer. And Basavana used to preach against idol worship. Well, in Hinduism, there is a stream which says idol worship is no good. Your communion with God does not need idol worship. That is also a legitimate part of Hinduism. He started talking about <laughs> against idol worship and he also has now been assassinated. So what I am trying to say is, what we are talking today about Sri Narayana Guru's social reform, his message of social enlightenment, of uh, breaking down caste and religious boundaries. Today, there are people in India who consider this to be blasphemy, consider this to be an attack on their religion, consider it to be an attack on their values, and they are prepared to even go to the extent of killing them. So that is why it is very important today when we are having this commemoration or memorial lecture in the memory of Sri Narayana Guru to remember that we must now stand up for the philosophy, world outlook and values that he stood for. And is also necessary because there is a peculiar development in Kerala. And that peculiar development is the very forces who in the late 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century would have virulently opposed the preaching and message of Sri Narayana Guru are today saying we want to be considered as the true followers of Narayana Guru. See, Narayana Guru, like Dr. Ambedkar, revolted against the religious orthodoxy of that time. They were against the Varnashrama Dharma, which had become part of the Hindu setup. They were against the Manusmriti. If you read the Manusmriti today, one cannot imagine anybody saying, yes, this is what we want. 
how they talked about women in society, for example. Forget about the Shudras and the Avarnas, the untouchables. But these are the forces which still uphold Varnashra Dharma and Manusmukhi. And they say they want to be part of this movement or part of this platform. That is why many people in Kerala today are looking at in great uh, surprise and revulsion that the leadership of the SNDP is saying, yes, we can join hands with the Hindutva forces. Because it goes against the basic moorings of the SNDP. I don't want to go into the history of the SNDP. The first general secretary of the SNDP was Kumar Rasha who was again a big figure of this social renaissance movement in Kerala. What is common between Sri Narayana Guru and all the other great social reformers of that period and those who advocate Hindutva today and stand for the Hindutva ideology? It is very necessary therefore to expose this effort to appropriate <coughs> the icons and the symbols of the great social reform movements. That is why we have the same reaction when they try to say that, yes, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, we accept. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, all through his life, fought against such forces which wanted to utilize religion for political hegemony and which wanted to justify the Varnashrama Dharma as an inherent part of our society. So that is why it's very necessary to expose these attempts to distort and give a regressive direction to the message and content of Sri Narayana Guru and the other great social reformers. In Kerala, this uh, effort to appropriate the social reform gains and to give it a Hindutva color is not going to succeed because as I said unlike in most other parts of India the political movement the national movement against imperialism and the social reform movement went hand in hand and out of that it was taken forward, as I said, by the then socialists and later the communists. So in Kerala, where during the Gurvayur Satyagraha, B. Krishna Palle was beaten unconscious by the temple priests and the guards in the temple. And A.K. Gopalan was also beaten subsequently outside the temple premises. These leaders not only took part in the social reform anti-caste movement, they were the leaders who also organized the peasantry, the working class and all those exploited sections. Whether they were Irava, whether they were Dalit, whether they were Nair, whether they were Christians or Muslims. So the class unity which was forged in Kerala was a unity not just on some economic demands of the workers or peasants. It was also a much deeper movement for economic emancipation, for social emancipation and also for political emancipation. So the people who have gone through this experience and who have developed what I said, the modern secular consciousness, democratic consciousness in Kerala, they cannot be easily subjected to or swayed by this so-called Hindutva ideology and communal ideology. I am confident about that because eventually in Kerala, the 
all the people belonging to the various <coughs> communities, whether they are Hindu, Muslim or Christian, or whether they belong to the various, they originate in various uh, social groups and castes. They have gone through this whole experience, which started, as I said, in the late 19th century, and which culminated in the 20th century in the widespread uh, development of not just democratic secular consciousness, but also a higher level of political consciousness, which is also a socialist consciousness. That is also developed in Kenya. So, to roll back this is going to be, I think, an uh, impossible task for the socially regressive forces. I am not talking only in political terms, of which political party will advance in elections, etc. I am talking in terms of the more basic social sense. The society in Kerala, I think, will be immune to, will resist, though of course efforts will be made. I think that what was started by these great social reformers like Sri Narayana Guru, that journey has not ended. Yes, there will be ups and downs, but I am sure that the people of Kerala and the society of Kerala will uphold the progressive, democratic, secular vision which unfolded in Kerala all through the 20th century. So I am confident that at this juncture, when India is faced by the twin threats of neoliberalism and communalism, that struggle which is there against these two forces in Kerala, as always, Kerala will show, will be in the vanguard to fight against these two regressive forces which are facing us in this situation.